man, my hair does not like to go straight when it's wet. All right, so by this point, it is no secret that there are a lot of Hunger Games clones out there. Like, just, just, just a lot of them. Okay, and I've done videos on this before, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. If you're really curious, check out my Hunger Games clones and how they work video. But after the Hunger Games came out and got super big, there were a bunch of things that tried to cash in on that popularity. So there were a bunch of stories that came out about a teenage girl, uh, there was, was an evil government in there somewhere, and there was some sort of rebellion, and so on and so forth. Like, there were a lot of stories that were just doing that exact same formula. And most of them attempted to do something at least a little bit different. You know, it may not have been something big, but it may have been something a little different. Like, uh, the Legend Trilogy, for instance, which is an okay series of books in my opinion, uh, that had two main characters, and it told the story from each of their perspectives. And at first, one of them is already a criminal who is on the run from the evil government, but the other one is working for the evil government. And so, that's a little bit different, even if the story is pretty much the same thing that we've seen a bunch of times before. Uh, the testing, which I have the first book right here, the testing is such a close copy of The Hunger Games, it is just borderline trademark infringement. Like, I have the other books here too, don't worry, this is a whole series. And, like, it's not even just in broad strokes, like, it takes some similar themes, or, okay, this is also a dystopian story about a teenage girl overthrowing an evil government, or anything like that. It directly takes plot beats, world-building bits, uh, characters, character development. Like, it lifts that directly from The Hunger Games, except it does them really shittily. Like, it, it does... it takes the exact same ideas and does them worse, basically. In other words, it takes the formula that The Hunger Games kind of created, and I know some people are gonna get on my ass about how, oh, actually, uh, there was this other thing that did something similar, therefore The Hunger Games is a rip-off. It, it really isn't, okay? Like, it, it was still combining things in a semi-unique way. So, get off, get off my ass about that. But this, this series copies that formula, like, to a T, without understanding any of what made it work, and so it just completely fails at it. Like, I know I've used this joke before, but this genuinely does feel like it was written by a machine in some ways. It's, it's kind of fascinating. And I'll, I'll say right now, this is an awful series, but at the same time, it was kind of nice to go back to something that was just a regular level of awful, you know? <laughs> After uh, The Way of the Shadow Wolves, that Steven Seagal train wreck that I <laughs> talked about a few months ago, th this is like a palate cleanser. You know, it's certainly bad, but it does feel somewhat competent in some areas, and we'll get into that as it goes on in the series. Like, there are a few bits where, okay, this isn't too awful, uh, and also, quite frankly, it's not full of all the bigoted shit that uh, Steven Seagal's book had, you know? <laughs> there's not, there's no anti-Semitism, there's no blaming the destruction of the world on the Catholics or anything like that. It's just, it, it's just a bad book series, so... It, it was kind of nice to just go back to something like that. If you want something to happen, you just need to pray and not be a Muslim or Jewish. Anyways, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot more I can say in the intro here. This book series is pretty bad. Uh, do I really recommend it to anyone? No. Like, if you're looking for something that's hilariously awful, you might get a few laughs out of this. Uh, it might be worth it to check it out from the library or something, but I wouldn't recommend buying it. And uh, I, can, I know this has, like, the sticker like it's from the library, but I did buy this. It's just bought used, and I was afraid if I tore that off, it would tear off half the cover along with it, so I just left it. But yeah, if you're looking for something hilariously bad, maybe borrow it rather than buy it. I don't think it'd be worth the price. Uh, and if you're, <clears throat> if you're someone who is genuinely into young adult dystopias and you want to read one of those, th there's better ones out there, like... Uh, you could read Legend, or Enclave, maybe, or... I actually just about finished reading the Configured Trilogy, which... I, I have criticisms of it, but I think it's an alright series overall. I might do a video on that, we'll see. And, I don't know, if you're looking for something like that, check out those. Uh, as for this, uh, we're getting into spoilers and everything, so if you... If you don't want to hear that, then leave now. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So first we have book one, which is just called The Testing. And 
I'll say that the cover, or at least this version of the cover I have here, is not half bad. Like, we can see half of a little medallion with a sigil on it, and then the title is just there. It just says, The Testing. There's a bunch of blank space, and then it just says, Your time is almost up, your time is almost up, your time is... and it gets cut off, almost like it's a repeating message. And that, that kind of adds a little sense of urgency to things, so I thought, I thought that was kind of cool. You know, nothing really special, but I thought it was neat. I know that some people might get annoyed by me constantly comparing this to The Hunger Games, but I'm going to have to do it a lot, especially at this beginning part. Uh, you'll see what I mean as we go on, but like I said earlier, it is just beat for beat exactly the same story uh, a lot of the time. So, uh, here, here we go. Let, let's, this is the testing. Graduation day. I can hardly stand still as my mother straightens my celebratory red tunic and tucks a strand of light brown hair behind my ear. Finally, she turns me, and I look in the reflector on our living area wall. Red. I'm wearing red. No more pink. I am an adult. Seeing evidence of that tickles my stomach. Are you ready, Sia? My mother asks. She, too, is wearing red, although her dress is made of a gossamer fabric that drapes to the floor in soft swirls. Next to her, my sleeveless dress and leather boots look childish. But that's okay. I have time to grow into my adult status. I'm young for it at 16. The youngest by far in my class. Okay, so uh, we have the boringest way that you can possibly start a story. It is the main character getting ready for school. Or, in this case, technically getting ready for graduation, but you know, close enough. Th that is just the most mundane thing imaginable. Okay, it it's not engaging in the slightest. Like, we don't know this person, so usually when you want to start off a story, you want to start it with something extreme. Like, that doesn't mean an action scene necessarily, but, you know, something interesting has to be happening if you want to grab somebody's attention. And staring in a mirror, getting ready for school, is not interesting or extreme or anything like that. You know, it's just, it, it didn't, it doesn't get you into the story. It's boring, it's mundane. And then we also have the fact that they're calling a mirror a reflector. And that sounds like super high tech, like they're trying to say, oh, they live in this crazy technological society, and I was thinking about that because I didn't really know jack shit about this series before going into it, I just heard it was laughably bad. And, um, they really aren't, you know, like, they don't live in that sort of world. Uh, they, in fact, the town they live in is pretty rural and not exactly poor, but they don't have a lot of technology that, um, we don't have today. In fact, a lot of the time their technology is less than what we have today. Uh, so I'm not sure why they would bother using like fancy sci-fi terms like that. Just say mirror. You know, it's a, it's a weird little moment which just took me out of it. And we're gonna see more of those going ahead. And so anyways, uh, the main character, her name is Sia, that's C-I-A, uh, is 16 years old and she's graduating from school. You know, I, I don't think they ever <laughs> specify what type of school. Like they say primary school or high school or anything like that, but it's just you know, graduating from school, and the whole colony attends graduation, even though there's only 14 kids graduating. And again, they mention that uh, the town they live in is pretty small. There's only less than a thousand people there. So it makes sense that there'd be that few kids at graduation, but why would everyone want to go? You know, is there, do they really have nothing else going on? I, I suppose so. Zine and my other brothers are definitely not slobs. In fact, girls practically throw themselves at them. But while my brothers aren't immune to flirting, none of them seems interesting in settling down. They're more interested in creating the next hybrid tomato plant than starting a family. Zine, most of all. He's tall, blonde, and smart. Very, very smart. And yet he never got chosen for the testing. The testing is capitalized, by the way, because, you know, why come up with an actual name for things when you can just turn a noun into a proper noun? It's also nice of them to just come right out and say things about the characters. You know, like, my brothers are super smart and <clears throat> attractive and people like them and they make new types of plants and stuff, like... Okay, uh... I, I'm... See, at this stage, we should be learning about the protagonist, that is, Sia. And we, we aren't. Like, we're two pages in, we're learning about her brothers more than her. And I, I feel like if you're gonna give some sort of just straight-up explanation of somebody's personality, at least have it be someone important, like the main character, but we don't get that yet. And, uh, <clears throat> it's also very important to mention that the main character has a strong relationship with, uh, one of her siblings, and they also 
uh, later mention one of her friends named Dylene, who she has a super strong relationship with, apparently, but we never actually see it. And it's very important for us to, to see this because that's exactly what the Hunger Games did at this stage. It made sure to show us some time that she spent with Gale so that she, uh, so that we saw that how good friends they were, and it also made sure to show her taking care of her younger sister Prim. And, well, ag again, with that, it showed us, you know, we learned about Katniss and her backstory, and it also showed her, uh, well, not quite this early on, but later on we saw her volunteering to take uh, Primrose's place in the Hunger Games, so even if we hadn't up until that point seen her actually taking care of her sister, like helping her get dressed and ready, that sort of thing, even if we hadn't seen that, we would know, oh, okay, she does really love her sister, she's willing to die to protect her. Uh, Sia, we just hear, like, yes, I, I love my brothers, I guess, and that's... I, I guess we just have to take her word for it, so... It's doing the same thing that the Hunger Games did at the beginning, but it's doing it really crappily. You know, like, uh, uh, Sia's friend Dylene is, like, mentioned a few point times in this, uh, beginning section of the book, and I don't believe she's ever even brought up again the rest of the series. Like, it, with Katniss and Gale, we saw them go out into the woods and hunt together, so they spent some time together, at least. You know, I, I at least bought that they were friends. So, we learn over the course of the uh, next couple of pages that they live in the Five Lakes Colony, which is part of the United Commonwealth, and that every year at graduation, some of the students which have done the best in school are chosen for something called the testing, which is pretty mysterious, but basically it's some uh, sort of testing process that you have to go through, and if you pass, then you get to be chosen for uh, to attend the university, which is in uh, the United Commonwealth's capital, which is Tosu City. I don't know why they call it that either. Uh, but <laughs> you go to the university and then you can become like a doctor or an engineer and, you know, help rebuild the world after it was destroyed. Now, I'm the thing, the Five Lakes name, uh, it says that it was named after the Five Great Lakes. Like, in the book, she said that. So I was thinking it could be anywhere in the Great Lakes region. And so I was thinking, like, Okay, that doesn't really narrow it down. Why would you give us that broad of an area? Uh, but apparently there's also a really tiny, unincorporated town in Michigan called Five Lakes, so it might just be there. I'm not totally sure, but I feel the need to bring that up so that everyone else can argue about it uh, in the comments. And I will also say that their country being called the United Commonwealth is a dumb name. Like, the United Commonwealth of what? Like, uh, and also... United Commonwealth just it, it sounds weird because it's singular and I know people are gonna say the United Kingdom ha 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 well its full name is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland like it and it was separate kingdoms before that all came together into one that's why it is named that and then there's also the United States well that's not its full fucking name it's the United States of America this is just called the United Commonwealth that's a stupid name and we also have a moment where Sia mentions that she's mechanically inclined. The option seems bleak at best, since my thumb is anything but green. The last time I helped my father, I almost destroyed the sunflower seedling he'd spent months creating. Mechanical things I fix. Plants I kill. So, we, we don't see her doing anything uh, to show us that she's good at mechanical stuff. Again, I, I have to keep mentioning the Hunger Games because this is beat for beat very similar. With Katniss, we saw her be a hunter. You know, we saw her out in the woods laying traps, tracking animals, shooting her bow and arrow, and so from that we know later on when she's stuck in the arena that those are the sorts of skills she's going to use which will help her survive. And just based off of, okay, now that we know something Sia's apparently good at, a better opening would be Sia is working on an engine or something, and then her mom comes in and she goes, Hey, you're gonna be late for graduation, you gotta get ready. And she goes, oh yeah, I lost track of time. And then they go and get ready for graduation. Like, just that little bit of opening would already tell us so much more about Sia, about her character, about the world she lives in. Uh, and if she was working on the engine, like, with her father or her brother or something, then that would tell us more about their relationship. Like, that's just a much better opening, you know, and much more interesting. And, I don't know, the rest of the opening chapter is pretty standard, you know, the, uh, the Sia and the other kids all graduate in a normal ceremony, you know, there's nothing strange about it, it's not like they all have to strip their shirt off and 
get whipped or anything as part of the passage into adulthood. It's just like, yep, they call off their names, and now you're graduating, now you're adults, yay. Uh, Sia hopes that she gets chosen for the testing, and then nothing interesting happens there. Uh, the only funny bit is that we learn her full name is Melencia Vale. That's... What? And, and then there's other dumb names, too, like Dylene, and I, I mentioned her brother's name, Zine. Uh, it's just... What? Why do these characters all have such dumb names? Oh, that's right, because the Hunger Games did it. You know, the Hunger Games had people that were named things like Katniss Everdeen and Effie Trinket and Peeta Malark and Plutarch Heavensby, so for a while, every YA dystopia book, without really thinking about why everyone had weird names, they just decided to also give characters weird names. So then Sia gets called to the mayor's office, and there's three other kids there, and uh, there's also a representative from Tosu City named Michael, and he just tells the kids, oh, by the way, Michael is spelled weird. I assume it's still pronounced Michael, but I, I don't know. It, it could be like Michal or Mitchell, Michal, something like, I don't know. But the point is, uh, he tells all the four kids that are there that they've been selected for the testing and they're all happy about it. And apparently not going to the testing when you're called is treason, which is weird. Like, I... I I can understand it being illegal to not come when you're called, but calling it treason is an odd choice. So yeah, we also have the main character being chosen for some sort of dangerous competition against her will because, well, that's exactly what Katniss Everdeen did. The main difference here is that Sia, as well as the others that are chosen, uh, including the, the only two that are important really are this boy named Tomas and this girl named Zandri. And we'll, we'll get more to them later, but the, the only real difference uh, here is that Sia actually wants to go to the testing because she doesn't know it's dangerous. I mean, I'll, I'll give it that. That is at least a little bit different. That, that is, that has potential to be interesting. Like, uh, the characters go through this and then they realize, oh shit, our government is evil. And then they have to deal with that as opposed to Katniss knowing right from the beginning that her government is evil because... Well, every year they take a bunch of kids and murder them on television where she has to watch, and they also keep everybody in extreme poverty so that they can live in luxury over in the capital. You know, like, th that is at least a little bit different, but at the same time, we don't know Sia, and we don't really respect her either. You know, like, like I said, Katniss uh, volunteered to save her sister's life to go to the Hunger Games. Like, she was not expecting to come home. Like, she, she was expecting to die when she left. And so that's why when she said goodbye to everybody, it was so tearful and sad and shit like that. But Sia is just like, oh, cool, I did really well in school, and now I get to be chosen to maybe go to the university and get a good job and stuff later. Cool. And it is a little dumb that uh, kids are excited about this because apparently no one ever comes back from the testing. Like, nobody. No, nobody ever comes back. It's not most people don't come back, and so people are thinking, oh, I don't know, it might be dangerous, some of them might die. It's like no one ever comes home, because supposedly they all get jobs in other colonies. So it seems kind of dumb that people would actually be excited for it and think, wow, I'll never see my family again, awesome. Like, some people, yes, would be excited about that, but not everybody. Also, we're only 24 pages in, and brief thing I have to mention is that this is also written in first person present tense. Why? Because The Hunger Games was written in first person present tense. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not like that was the first uh, book to ever do it, but at the same time, uh, it really took off and became popular in this genre. And the only reason it was popular in this genre is because they did it, you know, and everyone else was just copying without really thinking about why uh, they did it or how it worked. But yeah, the, the biggest issue here is we just, uh, we don't know much about Sia. Like, I know it sounds like I'm glossing over things, but I'm really not. Like, Katniss we knew was brave, we knew she loved her sister, we knew she was a hunter, we knew she hated the government and the Hunger Games, etc. And whether or not you find her to be a likable character, or a super interesting character, is obviously subjective, but at least we knew some things about her as a person. Sia? We know she's apparently good with mechanics. We know she's apparently smart, like she was good at school and stuff. Uh, and that's that's about it. Like, you know, why 
Why should we care about her? You know, we also know that she's not poor, so she doesn't really have any reason to dislike the government or anything. So, eh. Okay, it's just, it's just, they're not giving me a reason to care so far. It's just, yep, there is this person who is a blank slate, and she's about to do some stuff. So Sia's dad tells her about his experience during the testing, and how he apparently doesn't really remember much of anything that happened during it. All he knows is that there were some people who went there with him, and they just disappeared afterwards. He never saw, saw them or heard from them again. Uh, he heard they apparently went to work in another colony, but that's all he knows, and he remembers being in, like, a ruined city and seeing dead bodies around. That's, that's all he remembers, just a few snippets of violence. And so Sia gets a little bit nervous, but she's still not thinking that hard about it. She's like, well, I'm sure I'll be fine. What are you, retarded? So to prepare for this, Sia takes uh, her brother's communicator. Like, remember her brother's Zine. Uh, he has this communicator, which is kind of like a phone. You know, it has like a calculator and stuff on it, which can make it useful. And she just, she just steals it without asking or anything. Like, you're kind of a bitch for doing that, Sia, but all right. And I, I also feel the need to bring up, she has several other siblings, which are barely ever mentioned. Like, okay, at first I was thinking, all right, she has uh, several other siblings. She has like her old brother, Zine, and then she has another brother whose name also starts with a Z, whose name I'm not gonna bother to look up. Uh, she has two younger brothers who are twins. Like, you know, she, she has a decent sized family. And at first I saw that and I was like, okay, that, that makes sense in these circumstances. Uh, but the only one who really gets any sort of screen time or any even, like, mention by Sia is Zine. And, well, I mean, if you're only going to uh, focus on that relationship, even if they don't actually focus on it that much, then why wouldn't you just have her be, have him be her only sibling? You know, it, it would feel a little bit less like these others are just there to take up space. And th this is a brief aside, but... I've mentioned this once or twice before, I also have multiple siblings, and it's very rare to see that done in anything. You know, whether we're talking books or movies or anything, usually when somebody has siblings, it's just one. So it's just a relationship with, between those two people, as opposed to a relationship between four or five or six different people who all have their own unique ways of feeling about one another, and they don't always get along, and, you know, it's just more interesting to see those multifaceted relationships, and it, it's difficult to write, certainly, but you can do it. Uh, in fact, the only series I can think of that really did this well was Maximum Ride, and I just got a little bit excited for a minute, thinking, oh, maybe they'll do that, and they didn't, so I was, I was let down. So, the next day, Sia and Tomas and the others uh, go with the testing official, who, again, his name is Michael, uh, and he takes them away on some sort of futuristic vehicle. Uh, in this case, it's what's known as a skimmer, and it's basically just a hovercraft, you know. The, uh, tech, the actual technology behind it seems a little weird because it can only hover about 15 feet above the ground, and apparently if you go over, like, a chasm or something, it'll just stop working and fall. That, that's a little weird. I don't know how that works, but whatever. And, uh, you know, just like, just like in the Hunger Games, the... Katniss and Peeta got taken off in a futuristic train off to the capital city. And so, while all this is going on, Sia also meets with Tomas, who is her love interest, by the way. Why is he her love interest? I don't know. He, he just is. Like, they, they meet... They, they've met before, obviously, because they grew up in a small town together, but she just decides she can trust him, and she tells him about her dad having visions that maybe the testing is dangerous, and then I guess they're in love from this point forward. I, I know it sounds like I'm skipping over things, but that really is what it feels like. Uh, and also, the, her love interest is going to have to compete against her when they get into the testing because Katniss and Peeta. The, the difference here is that, uh, one, they aren't going to have to kill each other, at least as far as we know at this point, they aren't going to have to kill each other, so there's no real sense of urgency or tragedy or danger or anything, the way there was with Katniss and Peeta. Like, they're starting to like each other a bit, but it, we know that before the book is over, one of them's gonna have to die, so... It, there's a there's an element of tragedy there, which isn't there with Sia and Tomas. There's also a small difference that another girl who comes with them, whose name is Zandri, 
she flirts with Tomas, and he does not seem to reciprocate or anything. Uh, that That's about it, really. Like, Sia just doesn't like her that much. And, uh, yeah, uh, also, like I said, Sia tells Tomas her concerns, and not, not only does she trust him instantly, but he trusts her instantly. So, cool. And then I see it, what the others are watching with shining eyes and open mouths. Up ahead, beyond the water, silver buildings, lights bright enough to be seen for miles and miles. These can only mean one thing, Tosu City. We're here. In school, we've been taught that 99 years ago, Tosu City was created as the first tangible sign that we as a people had survived the seven, seven stages of war. The four stages of destruction that humans wrought on one another, and then the following three stages in which the Earth fought back. This spot was chosen because its predecessor was deemed an unimportant military target by the wagers of war. While it could not escape the corruption of the Earth or the earthquakes, tornadoes, and floods, much of the city still stood when the Earth quieted and those alive le left alive began to rebuild. Okay, so now we're checking off the part where the main characters arrive in the technologically advanced capital city. The only difference here is that they're actually happy to be there, so again, no tension or anything. Uh, I will say it is a bit nice to get more information on the apocalypse. You know, we didn't, we didn't get that in the Hunger Games, and in this, uh, they go into more detail as the story goes on, but it's mentioned a bunch of, like, chemical and biological weapons, as well as nuclear weapons, uh, were sent out all over the world, and so that actually just destroyed the environment and makes a lot of the land poisonous and stuff, so it, it is nice to get something a little bit different. Uh, that's just genuinely a nice part of the series. Like, no qualifications or anything. Uh, and so they arrive, they begin to meet the other candidates for this dangerous competition. I, I might just have to start putting up, like, a counter for the number of times that this is just directly ripping off the Hunger Games. Not even similar, just like beat for beat the exact same thing. Uh, so Sia meets her roommate, a girl named Rhyme. Why, why are these names so weird? I don't get it. Uh, and they also meet uh, this fellow named Dr. Barnes who is just in charge of the testing. And he becomes more important later, but you know, for now he's just, he's the guy who's in charge. And so for starters, Sia takes a regular written test. Like, that's the first round, is she just takes a regular test, and there's like math and science and stuff like that, and... Okay, for starters, we're like 80 pages into the book at this point, and it's simultaneously too short and way too long. Like, we don't really know any of the characters at this point. We know very, very little about Sia, because, keep in mind, uh, Around uh, 80 pages into the Hunger Games, we were, I believe, also just getting ready to uh, to go into the Hunger Games. You know, they were training and stuff. But we spent a lot more time before the Reaping happened, so we actually got to know Katniss in them. Whereas this, uh, you know, they've been trying to build up to this testing, but we haven't really gotten that much about it. Just little snippets like, oh, it might be dangerous, ooh. But most of the characters aren't really all that freaked out about it, so it's difficult for us to be freaked out about it. So it's simultaneously too short and too long. It, it's really, really obnoxious, if I'm being honest. Uh, they also take the opportunity for Sia to take a history exam, and she just answers questions about the history of the world, and that's a convenient excuse for some exposition. And the only dumb bit about that is how all continents apparently merged into single countries. Like, there's the South American Coalition and the Asian Coalition and stuff like that, which is just really lazy, but eh, it, it's not a huge deal. I'm not, I'm not too upset about it. And plus, she meets other candidates who are named Will and Gil. Like, th there's twin brothers named Will and Gil. And, and th they meet a couple other candidates, but I'm just bringing up Will and Gil because they're going to be important later. Like, this series actually has a lot of characters who get mentioned once or twice and then never show up again. It's, uh, it, it makes it a little difficult to know who you should pay attention to as you're reading. I liked this bit, though. Rhyme's eyes narrow. She bites her bottom lip and studies me for several moments. I guess she's trying to determine whether I'm telling the truth. She'll probably decide I'm attempting to get inside her head since it's something she would do. Face it, anyone who brings a stack of corn cakes with her and doesn't eat a single one isn't above screwing with someone's mind. See, I like that bit because... It's Sia having a little bit of personality in her narration, and it's one of the only times in the entire series where she does it. So, you know, again, this series, while it is overall really bad, does have little moments like that, which I, I kind of liked. 
you know, like, it, it is not the worst series I've ever read by a long shot, but you know, it's still pretty bad, but you know, it's, I, I want to point out the good when I see it. And uh, a little while after this, Rhyme hangs herself. Now, you might be hearing that and thinking like, oh, okay, is it like murder or something? Because Sia just comes in the room and sees her hanging. She's like, oh my god, what happened? And so reading that, I thought like, oh, okay, it's murder. Maybe it's part of a bigger story. Maybe Rhyme came across some information she shouldn't have and they had to cover it up. But no, uh, apparently she was just super stressed about the testing and killed herself. Oh, okay, uh, I don't want to try and sound like I'm making light of it because that sort of thing does happen in real life, like, you know, teenagers do get super stressed out and commit suicide and it's obviously very bad, but it is weird that they just brought it up and that was, that was it. Like, it, ne it never leads to anything. So later, Sia, Tomas, and Zandri hang out and they eat lunch and they fix a water pump that's on the testing grounds, because, uh, like, see, at this point, we're actually seeing Sia be, uh, mechanically inclined, which is nice, it's just, it, I, I wish that they had introduced it earlier, and it hadn't just been her saying, yeah, I'm really good with engines and stuff, like, if we had seen her do this, like, near the beginning of the book, it would have been much more, a much better and much more interesting way to introduce this, uh, thing, because, as far as I'm concerned, characters are a lot more interesting, especially protagonists, are a lot more interesting if they're really, really good at one or two things, and then really, really bad at one or two other things, and then about average at things in the middle. So if Sia was, say, really, really good at mechanical stuff, and she was also just a really good shot with a handgun, because she does fire a uh, handgun later on in this book, uh, we'll get to that, don't worry, and, but she was also, like, not in great shape, uh, and she was not good with knowing about plants and stuff, which it is mentioned at the beginning that she's bad with plants, but the series does not follow through on that. And so if, if that was the case, then I think I'd be much more interested in her by this stage. Um, and we'd also be thinking like, oh, okay, so some of those are going to give her trouble when the testing like really gets started, so she's going to have to rely on other people for help, but at the same time, she's not going to be useless. She's going to be good at some other stuff, and that would just be... I don't know, they'd just be much more interesting. But anyways, they're, they're just sort of hanging out, eating lunch, and then they fix a pump. And uh, again, the Hunger Games at this stage, like before the Hunger Games really got started, before they were thrown in the arena, was much more stressful because you knew that not only were you likely going to die, but you were going to have to kill some of these other people, and some of them were going to be very difficult to kill. Like, So it was stressful. There was a sense of urgency here. And... This just this just feels like a college tour, you know. It, there's there's no tension. There's no there's no real story at this stage. So all the candidates who failed the first round of tests, remember the like the written ones where they're just asking about math and shit, uh, they disappear. Like they just say, "Yep, they they failed, so they're gone now." But they're also never going home. They're they're going off to other colonies. We have jobs for them there. Like who who would buy this? Like my immediate thought would be, "Oh, okay, they're being killed." or disappeared, or something. Like, who who would believe the government when they just tell them this? You people are so stupid. So anyways, we go to the second round of testing, which is, uh, there's actually a few smaller bits. Basically, they put them in this room, and they give them this box of a bunch of different samples of plants, and you, they have to determine which ones are safe and which ones are poisonous. Which is, I mean, that's neat enough. You know, because especially because they make you put them in two different piles, and the pile that's poisonous, you have to actually eat a sample of them. So if you get it wrong, you could very well die. And that is actually kind of a neat uh, test. I think it's a little bit more stressful, than, certainly, than just regular written ones. But Sia should be bad at it, uh, but she just passes without any real issue. So that's what I mean. Earlier on, it said she was bad with plants, even though her dad and her brother worked with them but we don't really see that, you know, and this goes on for the rest of the series as well. Like, she apparently just knows what plants are safe to eat, and she knows which ones are poisonous, and just... It, character flaws don't actually count as character flaws if they don't cause them any trouble. Now, my suggestion to make this a bit more interesting, and this could go for the earlier written exam as well, would be to 
rather than just making it a test on the character's knowledge, make it a test on them trying to cheat without getting caught. Now, if any of you have ever seen Naruto, there is an actual story arc where they had the characters uh, take a written exam, but they actually made it interesting because the, the questions on the test were like way too difficult for them, and so the point wasn't could they uh, find the correct answers, the point was could they cheat and find out the correct answers without getting caught. You know, like it was really a test not about their knowledge, but about their ability to gather information without getting caught gathering information, you know, because they're training to be ninjas, you know? And so what I'm saying is that just them taking regular exams is really boring to read about, but you could still make it interesting. And they, this series just does nothing with that. It's just, yep, yep, here's the test. And anyways, like I said, they uh, eat the plants that they deem safe, and Sia turns out fine, but then one or two others start looking like they're sick or hallucinating or something. And then next they bring them a box with a radio, which is broken, and they have to fix it. And, okay, Sia being able to fix that is fine. Like I said, she's clearly mechanically inclined. She knows how to fix things. Like, I don't know a better term for, me for it than mechanically inclined. She's just good with machines and electronics and stuff. But anyways, uh, one boy actually fails, and apparently there's a booby trap in the radio which shoots a nail through his eye and kills him. This test is so fucking stupid, man. Like, imagine if ta you were taking a test at school and every time you failed it killed you. Like, e even setting aside the moral issues with that, if mistake equals death, then that means no one ever takes any risks. You know, if the punishment for failure is too high, then people are going to go to great lengths to avoid failing. And at that point, you're not really testing people on their knowledge or their perseverance or anything else like that. You're just testing... <sighs> whatever. It, it's dumb, okay? I don't think I need to go into too much more detail about why it's dumb to kill children when they fail exams. Then they have a little chemistry kit where it's like, hey, these samples of water are too dangerous to drink. Uh, put the right chemicals in to fix them. And that goes smoothly, and then everything is done. And then we go to the third round of testing, <laughs> which this is real fucking riveting, I'm telling you. It's, it's just, this is my favorite thing I've ever read. But anyways, uh, it's basically just a test of teamwork. Sia is there with Will and a couple of others, and uh, look, without going into too much detail, uh, Will kind of betrays the team and tries to get them all eliminated, but Sia figures it out at the last minute and then they all pass anyways, okay? I don't really feel like getting into more detail on that. But then we arrive at round four of the testing, which is the final test, which actually takes up a pretty substantial chunk of the book. And basically, what they're going to do here is they're going to drop the kids into the ruins of Chicago. I insert divergent reference here, I guess. Like, I don't know. D Divergent's a terrible series, but it is definitely the most successful Hunger Games clone. Uh, but anyways... They drop the kids off in the ruins of Chicago, and then the kids have to find their way to Tosu City, which, Tosu City, at this point, we don't know exactly where it is, but it is mentioned later that it's built on the ruins of Wichita, Kansas, which, if you're unfamiliar, is here. And so, basically, they have to go about 700 miles from there to Tosu City, and basically they just have to survive the trek, which is about uh, a little over 1,100 kilometers, if you were not American. And this is actually a decent idea because the environment is poisoned. Uh, it's just a dangerous area in general. Like there's mutated animals and things like that. A lot of stuff that could kill them and not even counting the other candidates who could also kill them. We'll get to that in a minute or two. Uh, it, it is a decent idea. And I will honestly say that this chunk, which is about a third of the book, or maybe a little over a third of the book in total, is the best part. It's not really doing anything great, but it's not doing anything phenomenally bad either. It is a decent enough story. We're just watching Sia go on this long, tr dangerous trek and has to work with some other people, and then there's some betrayals and stuff, and, like, it's it could be a lot worse. Now, we also learn around this time that there are apparently some people who are alive in this area, but they live outside of the United Commonwealth's control because we need the District 13 rebels to be there. 
Uh, the only real difference is that the people living outside the United Commonwealth's control don't really come back. Like, it'll seem like they come back for a while, but then there's a twist about that, and turns out they weren't actually there, and so it, it was kind of pointless to bring it up in the first place. And plus, I think it'd be more interesting if uh, Sia didn't know there was anybody out there, and then she saw somebody was out there. Like, sure, it'd be a cliche, but at least it would feel like they were trying. Now, here's the thing. This is obviously similar to the Hunger Games, because they're taking a bunch of teenagers, putting them into a dangerous situation, and giving them permission to kill each other. But in the Hunger Games, there was one winner. One. So, even if you teamed up with someone, it was going to be temporary, and you never knew if you could trust them. Excuse me, you never knew if you could trust anybody, and so on and so forth. Whereas this, there is apparently no limit on the candidates who can pass. Like, the people running the testing are just going to be watching them the whole time, and then uh, they're going to see, like, oh, okay, they did a good job here, they did a bad job there, and so at the end, they're going to evaluate them, and then they decide if they pass or not. There's no limit on the number of people who can make it through, so there's no... There's nothing stopping team-ups, is the thing. Like, it, not a big spoiler, Sia and Tomas meet up and team up together pretty early on here. And the, unlike with Katniss and Peeta, there's no sense of like, oh, they're going to have to kill each other at some point. Like, no, they're just, they're going to work together, and hopefully they'll make it to the end. Like, there's no real sense of urgency or danger there. And likewise, uh, all the other kids that are there have no real reason to be killing each other. Like, like I, I get that people can be ultra-competitive, and maybe you could get one or two people once in a while who'd be willing to kill others uh, to pass, but, like, you're not going to get your average person to just start hacking others up for, no, for very little reason like this. The, the average person just isn't that much of a psycho. You know, like, if you push them hard enough, then sure, they, they can kill people in self-defense or if they just feel it's necessary, but they're not going to start doing that for no reason. Like, if you told them, hey, if you fail, you die, then sure, maybe you could expect more of this, but as they go into this and people start attacking one another, it just feels really stupid. Like, it feels as though the author of this was like, okay, Hunger Games had something where the kids are all forced together and start killing each other, so I'm going to do the same thing, except she forgot to think of a reason why they would do that. So, as they're preparing to go, Sia takes a water cleanser, which makes sense. You know, she's gonna need that to, uh, cleanse water. Like, the, the water's not safe, like I said. Uh, she takes a medical kit. Again, makes perfect sense. If you get injured, you're gonna want to be able to deal with it. And she takes a handgun. The stash of crossbows, guns, and explosives catches my attention. If an animal attacks, I do not want to be caught unprepared. I've never fired a crossbow and immediately scratched that off my list. The explosives are unfamiliar and scare the crap out of me. I have fired my father's shotgun, and Dylene's dad taught us to fire his pistol. Dylene is a much better shot, but I can hit the center of a target at least 75% of the time. I finger the shotgun, which I am more comfortable with, but it only comes with a box of 10 shells. My fingers shift and close over a small black handgun that comes with two boxes of ammunition. Lightweight. Easy to carry. Enough bullets that I can take a few practice shots without worrying about running out. Okay, this is a bit of a pet peeve, and honestly, a very small issue in the grand scheme of things, but handguns are dumb. Like, were I in her position, I probably would have gone with the crossbow, just because, you know, it's quiet, has a lot of range, it's not that hard to use. Like, crossbows are really, really easy to fire, you just, you literally just point and shoot. Uh, but my second choice would probably have been the shotgun, because, you know, if there's gonna be wild animals or something, you're gonna want something with stopping power, and... Despite what video games and stuff would have you believe, shotguns do have decent range and accuracy. More so than a handgun, because handguns have very little range and very little accuracy, so even if you have a lot of bullets, that's not going to do you all that much good. Eh, especially because later on she starts making, like, stupid impossible shots with it. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not a huge deal. Like I said, this, this section of the book is halfway decent. So they take Sia and the others to the... <laughs> Well, I'm just gonna call it the arena, but you could also call it, like, the testing grounds or something if you'd rather. And they put her in a box, and then they open up the box, and she's just out there in the middle of everything, because 
That's how Katniss entered the arena in the Hunger Games. And then she walks through the ruins of a ruined city, which, as we know, is Chicago. And, again, there's no immediate danger here. Like, in the Hunger Games, it was a bunch of other people who were all trying to kill her right next to her. So it was, okay, fight or die, or run. And so she had to run away. There's no immediate danger here, so it's not very tense, and it's kind of lame, if I'm being honest. So then, uh, somebody sh attacks her with a crossbow. <laughs> See, I told you you should have brought it, Sia. And then they just fire a couple times, they miss her, and she shoots back a couple of times, and also misses, and then she runs off, and eventually Tomas finds her and they team up. The shame I felt earlier at my actions resurfaces, and I drop my eyes so that I don't see the censure that must be in Tomas's eyes, but he won't let me look away. Fingers lift my chin so I have to meet his gaze. In it, I see understanding, caring, and pride. You did the right thing. It takes courage to defend yourself, and I'm glad you did. I can't imagine what I would do if something happened to you. Yeah, it's nice of you to just spend some time really just sucking Sia's metaphorical cock, because we need to be told that we're supposed to love her. Like. Defending yourself is really not that brave. Like, okay, it's that or die. You know, most people in that situation will do something similar. They they might panic and freeze up, but that's not really a bravery thing. Like, I don't know. Again, we just know very little about Sia at this point. She's just such a blank slate that we have to be told to love her. And so from there, they begin their journey. They walk for a while. Then later they find uh, bikes, and they manage to fix them up, and they go, cool, we can go much faster now. And so they start riding their bikes through the rest of the testing grounds, and uh, they hear some people off in the distance, like, fighting and possibly dying, like they hear gunshots and stuff. Again, kind of dumb when you consider that uh, the average person isn't that psycho, but we already went over that. And so they're a little nervous, and then later they come across some random explosion which almost kills Tomas. And again, I think that was supposed to be like a landmine or something that was set by uh, the people who set up the testing. I think it also may have been a trap by one of the other testing candidates. It's not, it's not very clear what, what it is, and uh, I, I don't know, it bothers me that we never really find it out. Uh, but, you know, n nothing too crazy at this point. L like I said, this stage of the book is kind of okay. I don't really have a lot to talk about here. And yes, I did make uh, notes while I was reading, but a big part of the reason why I write my notes by hand, which you can see here, I, I write this out by hand, uh, is because it really forces me to think about uh, what's important and what is not important. And honestly, the small little bits like that just don't bother me that much. You know, like, unless they tie into some bigger problem, which in this case they don't. They also come across a dead body that was apparently killed by whoever had the crossbow, because apparently whoever fired it just has an infinite number of quarrels, or excuse me, bolts, and they just don't need to go and retrieve it for whatever reason, but okay, whatever. And then there's this. Tomas is more than willing to stop, especially when he checks Zine's device and sees we've traveled just over 45 miles in a single day. We are now a seventh of the way to Tosu City. While it's still far, the bicycles and the road we traveled give us a more optimistic view of this test. The river, like all untreated water sources, is tainted, but one look into the swirling waters tells us that at least some species of fish have adapted to the contaminants. While the contaminants make it dangerous to eat the fish raw, a pan and fire will make them more than edible. I don't think that's how dangerous chemicals work. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure... Well, for starters, I think the dangerous chemicals after a hundred years would have begun to dissipate, even if they weren't completely gone. Uh, and for another, it's gonna stay in the fish. Like, just because you fry it up doesn't mean it goes away. Like, it's still dangerous to you. And then the fact that they went 45 miles in a single day is, like, really, really fast. Like, I can understand going that far on bikes if they're, like, on a road, which is just going straight and doesn't have any major hills or bumps or detours that they have to take, but it's made pretty clear that they all of that happens. There are hills, there are traps and stuff, they have to take a lot of detours. They should not be going 45 miles in a day. First we do this geographic montage to show we've traveled a long way from your house. Whew, there, that should be enough. And here's a stupid line. They look pretty tired to me. If I didn't know about our crossbow friend, I'd say flag them down and see if we can help. They won't expect us to travel with them since they're on foot and we're on bicycles. Still, 
I can finish his thoughts. There are candidates out there willing to shoot. To kill. To get a passing grade on this test, no matter the cost. You know, I, I already I already explained why that was stupid. Like, it's not as though there's a limited number of slots. They don't need to kill each other, but just that line was kind of funny to me. So, yeah, pe people just aren't this psycho. They only did a death game because that's what the Hunger Games did, and the author didn't feel like coming up with good reasons to justify it. Now, uh, we also learned that there are some super mutated animals out there which still exist, which is a little weird. I don't think that's how radiation and chemicals work, but... Eh, whatever. Not a big deal. It's it's science fiction. There's gonna be some dumb shit like that in there now and again. Eventually they run into Will from earlier, and they just decide to start traveling together. And again, they, they already made it clear that they shouldn't trust other people, but they decide to trust him, even though he betrayed Sia earlier, just because... I don't know. Now Sia also sees a man outside of the fence, because this whole testing grounds is actually fenced in. Like, they have what must be several thousand miles of it, uh, which, basically, it's a funnel. It's really wide up near where they start, and it slowly narrows and narrows by the time they get closer to Tosu City so that they don't get too far off track, which, okay, sure, makes makes sense. Um, and Sia sees a man outside the fence, and he, the first time she sees him, she tries going up to talk to him, but he just throws a bag over the fence, and it has food in it, and she eats it, and it's fine, and... Basically, she actually meets him several times, and w rather than just going, oh, some other stuff happens, and then she sees the man on the fence, and then some other stuff happens, and then she sees him, I'm just gonna give you the the whole thing with her and the man. Uh, basically, his name is Simon, again, spelled weird, because why not, and he wants to end the testing. So not long after this, Sia meets some uh, other mutants, but these aren't mutated animals, these are humanoid, and she's pretty su sure they used to be humans because they seem slightly intelligent and they're also super dangerous and she kills one of them but and they attack her but she thinks that oh yes these even if they're not human anymore they used to be so she's a little freaked out by that which is a little weird like okay why would you put the kids here for the testing there's a difference between testing them on their like survival capabilities and their intelligence and all that and just putting them in a death trap like, it made sense for this sort of thing to happen in the Hunger Games, because not only was it more of a punishment for the government uh, to try and prevent people from rebelling again, but it was also entertainment. You know, it was a commentary on, like, reality TV and shit, and Americans' obsession with violent media, but, it, you know, it was entertainment for the people of the capital. Whereas this is just, what, like, why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. So Sia leaves for a little while to briefly talk to Simon, and that's when he mentions that he wants to end the testing, and then when she comes back, Will and Tomas are a little bit bruised up, and she asks him what's going on. Tomas looks away as Will says, The two of us shouted a lot after you left. We might have even thrown a punch or two. Then we decided to put our differences aside and get moving. About lunchtime, we ran out of water. We also ran into another testing candidate. Who? I ask, looking down the road. My heart quickens. Anyone we know? Will shakes his head. A guy from Colorado Springs Colony. Hey. Look guys, I've mentioned before, Colorado barely ever gets mentioned ever, and usually it's just Denver stealing our thunder. Like, let, let me have this, please. Plus, there's a bit of dried blood on Tomas's knife, so Sia already thinks like, oh, okay, they're not telling us everything, and they just tell her that, oh yes, we met this dude from Colorado Springs, and then he <laughs> talked to us for a while, and then he left, and Sia's like, well, they're definitely lying, but I'm not sure what to believe, and the evasiveness is only there for drama. Like, they, we find out what happened later, but it's just, it, it's only there for drama so that Sia can wonder, oh, maybe sh I shouldn't trust Tomas and Will. Like, you already shouldn't trust Will, but maybe I shouldn't trust Tomas. I don't know. Ooh. So they go through a ruined town, and they run into a bunch more mutants that are there. And at first, they try to be peaceful this time. Like, Sia just says, okay, let's keep our weapons down, like, have our hands in the air, and the mutants seem okay with it at first, like, seems like they're gonna let them just pass through without any issue. Uh, but then, another candidate shoots at them from a rooftop with a heavy machine gun. Okay, for those of you unaware, I, I'm not saying he shoots at them with, like, an automatic rifle. I mean a heavy machine gun, like... If you've ever, it's not explained in a lot of detail in the book, but 
A heavy machine gun is something from like World War II. If you ever see a movie or something and it's like uh, put up in a set up in a bunker or something and it's like really big. It's not easy to just carry around and you usually need two or three people to fire them depending on the type. I, I have so many questions. For starters, uh, the, the other candidate's name is Brick, by the way. Like, Sia helped him out during the teamwork test, so he feels like he owes her. Uh, and she... How did he get into this town and go up to the top of a three-story building without getting caught by the mutants, one? Two, why would they offer a heavy machine gun to testing candidates? Like, those other ones made sense. Like, you know, the crossbow, the shotgun, like, those are things you could carry with you if you're trekking through uh, the wilderness, but... A heavy machine gun, you that's very difficult to just carry around by yourself, even if you're a big dude. And why would Brick take it? You know, if he's looking for weapons, just take the shotgun or something, man. There's so many... I, there's so many questions I have here that I know I'm never going to get the answer to. <laughs> I don't know, plus the mutants are just nice, I guess. And Later, Sia notices that the scratch she got earlier is looking infected, so she has to treat it, and, she, like, she actually pulls metal out of it. I don't know how that works, because they literally just scratched her with their claws. Like, how would metal get in there? But, okay, whatever. So anyways, they fight a few more people. I don't know where these kids learn to sword fight, but they, like, Tomas and Will and some other guys, like, sword fight. It's... Okay. I'll just, I'll just go with it. And, uh, also, how did these other kids get ahead on foot? Like, that, that's what I'm wondering. You know, like, if they found other vehicles, then I guess I can understand it. And, like, Will does find a small skimmer at one point. Remember, like, those little hover cars, except his is more like a bike. So it makes sense that he could go fast, but did they put a bunch of other skimmers out there? It, it, it's vague, and I don't know how these other kids could get ahead of them to set traps and I also don't know why they would bother setting traps to try and kill the others, because, I mean, wouldn't it be better to just cross the finish line first at this point? The, the criteria for passing this test are so fucking vague, it annoys me. But, anyways, they fight some more people. Right before they get across the finish line, Will shoots Tomas, and we also learn that he was the guy with the crossbow from earlier. And we also learn that Zandri, that other girl that was flirting with Tomas earlier, and who came from Five Lakes with them, uh, she was apparently the one they ran into while Sia was off by herself, and they got into a fight with Will and them. Like, she freaked out because Will, apparently, she saw him kill somebody else with crossbow. And then she tried attacking him, and Tomas accidentally stabbed her. <sighs> Here's the thing. If you're going to have the main character's love interest be like, oh, he might be a bad boy, he might be someone dangerous, I, I don't know if I can trust him... Like, at least have the balls to actually make his actions a bit morally gray. Like, not only was what he did totally an accident, but it was also totally justified because Zandri was not explaining herself very well and she was straight up trying to kill this other dude. So it would be defense if uh, Tomas did that. I guess it's not technically self-defense because he's defending somebody else, but, you know, it's not... he's protecting somebody from somebody else trying to kill them. So, like, at least have the balls for it to be like, he thought she was the crossbow man, but later found out he was mistaken, and so that's why he felt so ashamed of it and didn't say anything like that. That would be kind of interesting, and it would do a lot for Tomas as a character, but instead we just, again, get generic love interest who feels bad about something bad he did that wasn't actually that bad, which I've seen so many times. Like, I, I didn't really see it in The Hunger Games, I don't think, but I, I saw it a lot in, uh, like, Twilight Clones, and and some of you might be wondering if I'm ever going to read more of those angel young adult books, and yes, I will, at some point, just not now. So anyways, Sia shoots Will, uh, but he doesn't die, he manages to get away, and then she drags Tomas the last couple of miles to the finish line, and they, they win, they pass the test. And at this point we learn that out of 108 candidates who originally came to the testing, 29 made it to the end of the finish line, and they still have to do a final interview and a final evaluation. Like, I'd be pissed <laughs> if I were that. I, I'd be pissed if I went through all of that and they're like, okay, you still have to have your college interview. Like, you, fuck you, dude, no. I, I'd be very annoyed if that were the case. Plus, plus um, what, now that we're got, getting to this point, I can just straight up tell you, 
it does not make sense to kill all these kids, partially because it's just not a good way of testing them, and obviously it is morally reprehensible. Like, I'm kind of operating on the assumption that you're all on the same page as far as that goes, but you're just straight up killing all of your smartest citizens. That That is stupid. I don't think I need to explain why that's stupid. Like, you, you're specifically saying we need to bring all our smartest uh, citizens to the testing so that we can send them to the university and then they can go on and develop new technology and help us fix the world from the people uh, who broke it, but, like, you're... You're, you're, you're just outright killing your smartest citizens. That you're actively setting yourself back. Why are you doing this? I don't understand. So while Sia was talking to Simon, he actually gave her this little uh, vial. Then he tells her if she drinks it, it'll allow her to avoid a truth serum, because during the interview they're going to ask her questions and they make her take a truth serum beforehand. And uh, she takes it and avoids doing that, but then she still gets her memory erased. Um... Okay, but, 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 before she got her memory erased, she recorded a message for herself on the communicator that she stole from her brother. Yeah, remember that? She stole from her brother? Yeah. Anyways, um, she recorded that, and then at the very end of the book, she listens to it. So what was the point of having her lose her memory if she just instantly relearns everything? You know, like, why not just have it so that Simon gave her a drug that made her immune to the memory loss? Wouldn't that, would, like... Wouldn't that make more sense and waste slightly less time? Like, it's just... It's just a pointless diversion at that point. You know, like, if she actually lost her memory and then she didn't have it in the second book and she had to relearn some stuff, that would... I mean, that would be lame, certainly, but at least it would be different. You know, at that point, it would be like Hush Hush, which if you ever saw my review of it, the main character does lose her memory of the events of the first couple of books and she has to spend almost 200 pages getting them back, which is really obnoxious, but... At least it's something. And so we also end this one with the future being very uncertain and the characters kind of shaken by everything that happened because that's how the Hunger Games ended. And that is, uh, that is the end of book one. So, as I said, a lot of parts of it are just copying Hunger Games beat for beat. Like, if you were to go and see the smaller details, it, it becomes even more obvious, but I think you get the picture when I just point out the bigger offenders. That would be okay if they did something a little bit different with it, or if they even just understood what made the Hunger Games work so that they were able to copy it effectively, but they don't understand what made it work. They're just following the checklist, and so all that foundation that the Hunger Games had to lay in order for the checklist to work is not there, and everything just falls through. It's like the cargo cults, at least I think that's what the cargo cult is called, Basically, there was this uh, island which was mostly uncontacted up until World War II, and then the natives there uh, ran into a bunch of, I believe they were American soldiers, who uh, were, you know, calling in supply drops and stuff uh, and doing marches and everything, and sometimes they would share their supplies with the natives, and then after the war ended, they left. And so the natives thought, okay, well, we want some of those supplies again, so they tried, uh, like, doing marches and drills the way the soldiers did and they also tried making like radio headsets out of coconuts and stuff to summon more supplies but it didn't do anything like they were just going through the motions without understanding what made it work and this series reminds me of the cargo cults in a weird way like they're just copying what came before but they don't understand what came before so it doesn't work and without a purpose this dystopia just feels nonsensical like the thing about dystopia, I've said this before, but if you really want a dystopia to work, it has to be commenting on something about society. Like, and it's not to say a story is always going to be bad if you're not putting social commentary in there, far from it. Like, there's plenty of them that don't do that and still work out pretty well. But, like, it's a dystopia, and so it feels very nonsensical. Like, The Hunger Games was talking about... American Obsession with Violent Media, it's talking about how reality TV is really shitty, and it's talking about how uh, uh, differences in classes, is, or economic classes, I should uh, say, cause a lot of issues in society, and how it's really just not fair to leave people in poverty so a couple of them can have all these luxuries. What is the testing about? Uh, I guess the author just really hated taking exams when she was in school, but 
that like the exams in this are blown so out of proportion that it doesn't really work as any sort of metaphor or anything. So it's just uh, nonsensical and when the world is nonsensical, the story feels nonsensical too. And I think that maybe this could have been saved if the characters were a lot better, but we kind of went over that already. You know, Sia's a blank slate. Tomas is just her love interest, who is her love interest because Sia needs a love interest. Uh, the only one that really had any personality was Will, and he was an asshole, so it's not like he was saving anything. Like, the only way I can think of this sort of premise working without it just being a straight-up ripoff of The Hunger Games. Because, you know, obviously the author wanted to do a bunch of teenagers in a death game without it seeming exactly like The Hunger Games, which was already pretty similar to Battle Royale, but she, she wanted to do something like that, but she couldn't think of a good reason to have it that wasn't just the exact same thing. And so the only way I can think of that this might have worked would be if this is like some sort of barbaric society where they don't even really have technology or democracy or anything like that. And the way you become leader is just by killing the people who are already in charge. Like, that that wouldn't be a very effective society, but things like that have kind of existed in the past. So, like, if, if the testing in this was just some sort of competition to see who would become the leader, and so that's why they were killing each other and scheming all the time, I could maybe see it working, but that's about it. So now we're at book two, Independent Study, which, I mean, I, I liked in the first book when it had Your Time Is Almost Up written across the bottom, but in this one it just has that again. Like, come on, it's the second book, at least do something a little bit different with it. But in the first book, that one felt a bit stretched out in a lot of places, uh, particularly with, like, all the regular exams, you know, like, we're just taking written history exams, and we have to read about that for, like, an entire chapter. It's really stretched out. Uh, but then, in other places, it's too short. Like, uh, the beginning, as I mentioned. We needed more time to really get to notice, to get to know Sia and to get to know Five Lakes uh, before they really went off on their adventure because we didn't really get to care about them. Uh, and plus, I didn't really point this out, but there are a lot of parts where Sia's narration is just like an abridged version for whatever reason. Like, rather than having a conversation play out, it'll just be a couple of sentences of Sia going, I explained to him this. He was a little concerned, but after a minute, he started to see things from my point of view. Like, it'll just be that rather than having the conversation play out, which is a little unsatisfying. Like, I understand doing it once in a while, but you know, they do it a lot. So it's kind of annoying. And, but, Despite the first book having some issues with pacing, the second and third books combined could genuinely have been, like, less than 100 pages. Like, these copies combined are about 600. They they could have been less than 100. I, I am not joking when I say that. Like, this entire series has enough material for one decent length book, I think. Like, if you wanted to make a trilogy, because that's what the Hunger Games did, that's the only reason they did it, um, but if you wanted to make a trilogy... You could have expanded on some other stuff, but, like, there's just not enough here for that. There just isn't. Now, I will say that the second and third books from this point forward are less of a ripoff of The Hunger Games. Like, you know, you might think that, oh, okay, it's just gonna follow the same thing of, like, oh, they're, after the testing, they're all kind of freaked out, and Sia's looking for a way to undermine the government, and then the rebellion kicks off, and then the third book's about that, and... Eh, not not really. It It is at least a little bit different than The Hunger Games from this point forward. That's not to say there aren't a lot of similarities, because there are, but it, it also doesn't replace any of the different... the It doesn't replace it with anything good. You know, they, they remove all the fun parts from The Hunger Games and then just leave all the shitty parts. So we start things off exactly the same as we started the first book off. Examination Day. I slide the cool material of my shirt over the five long jagged scars on my arm and examine myself in the reflector. We started the last book with her just staring in the mirror and getting ready for school, and now we're starting this book with her staring in the mirror and getting ready for school. Why, why do you hate me? Joelle Charbonneau? Like, I don't know anything about Joelle Charbonneau. She might be a ter perfectly nice lady for all I know, but I feel like she hates me. Why? Why? And despite having two books in a row start off with the main character examining themselves in a mirror, we still don't actually know what Sia looks like. Like, she gets very little description throughout all of this. Like, 
She has light brown hair, and we learn what kind of clothes she has. And at one point, she mentions that she's kind of short. And that's pretty much all we learn about what she looks like. Like, if you're going to use the cliche, at least use it properly so we know what she looks like. Like, jeez, man. Like, she, it, this is a first-person uh, perspective book, so it is admittedly difficult to come up with ways uh, for the character to describe themselves that don't sound a little bit stupid, but it, it, the opportunity was there. You gave yourself the opportunity. Take advantage of it. So, anyways, th this one starts off months after the first book, because that's what Catching Fire did, and uh, Sia has gone through uh, preparation school, and she's about to start at the university, and she wants to join the mechanical engineering program. She's afraid of the biology program because she mentions that being assigned to biological engineering scares her because her father and brothers are geniuses at coaxing plants to thrive in the war-scarred earth, but she also says she kills every plant she touches. Like, I mentioned this already, but she said she's bad, and then she's perfectly fine at finding all the good plants that you can eat and knowing which ones are poison and all that, and then she's saying that she's bad again. <sighs> Look, at least stay consistent with this sort of thing. Either have her be good and stay good all the way, have her be bad and stay bad all the way unless she, like, learns more and, or something. Uh, but just... You're, you're contradicting yourself. Jesus, man. Come on. <sighs> it, and again, it's just a flaw that she was given that never actually affects her. And apparently, the only fields of study that are at the university are education, biological engineering, mechanical engineering, medicine, and government. That's it. Those are the only things you can study at this school. Like, that's it? There's no other knowledge needed? They don't need to know about psychology, or history, or sociology, or technology development, or computer engineering, software engineering, anything like that? Like... That, that's not important, I guess, and the thing is, they mention at a few points that they do really want to keep knowledge from the past, uh, like, in fact, whenever they find any books anywhere out there uh, which are uh, in good repair, they bring them to the library in Tosu City because it's so important for them to hold on to knowledge, and uh, if it's in bad repair, then they send it somewhere else to be recycled because paper is very valuable because most of the trees were destroyed during the Seven Stages War. Now, um, I actually kind of like that detail. That detail It is a nice world-building detail, but at the same time, it, it just doesn't match up with what we're seeing here. So they take another written exam. Now open your books and turn to page whatever. Now where's Sakata? I better check the girls' locker room. I'm so riveted. I'm, I'm so riveted. It's like I'm getting my cock sucked by Jesus himself. Uh, but uh, Sia passes the exam, obviously, and she gets assigned to study government, which she really didn't want to do. Which is weird, because, like, why would you mandatorily assign people to study things that they hate? It seems like they do a very bad job in that case, but... Eh, whatever. Whatever, man. I'm not gonna... I'm not getting into that. And then Sia sees another student whose name is Obadiah, who apparently failed. I'm not sure what I think. Obadiah isn't a friend. In fact, I don't think he could claim that standing with anyone here. A few have tried to engage him in conversation, including me, a week after arriving on campus. I saw him sitting by a tree, looking off into the distance. While his powerful build, fierce expression, and exotic-looking braided hair would normally intimidate me into keeping my distance, the sadness I saw in his eyes had me walking toward him. The moment I said his name, his expression changed. Sadness was replaced by anger. He demanded I leave. I did. The experience was enough to keep me from repeating the overture. Now I wish I had. So, not only, not only are we getting a really unnecessary amount of detail about this character who we've never heard from before and will very quickly disappear from the story, but we're actually getting more detail about his appearance than we are about Sia's, or even Tomas. Jesus, man. Come on. Okay, so, uh, basically, Sia sees Dr. Barnes, who, again, is the head of the testing, remember? Uh, he takes Obadiah away, unconscious, uh, and he's with somebody else as well, and they mention that Obadiah is going to be redirected, and based on the way everyone seems to disappear after the testing, like, whether they pass or fail, I would 
ass immediately assume that he's just being killed. Like, I don't know why they'd be doing this, but I would just assume, like, oh, okay, yeah, everyone... Everyone dies. Okay, that that's bad. Dr. Barnes is evil. But, and again, like, nobody notices this. It's mentioned that there's not a lot of people left in the world at this point. Like, Tosu City has about 100,000 people, and the colonies, uh, Five Lakes only has less than 1,000 people, and all the others are supposed to be a lot bigger. I would say there's, like, less than 200,000 people in the entire United Commonwealth, and, like, they, they don't notice all their kids just disappearing every year. Like, yeah, that, that's weird. Okay, whatever. So, uh, Dr. Barnes and his assistant talk about their evil plans. I'm not sure why, because... Like, they should already know their evil plans, and this is really just here so that the main character can eavesdrop and find out what's going on. Um, and apparently, they mention that the president of the UC is very concerned about the testing and how so many people keep disappearing, but apparently the president also can't do anything about it. Like, the president has no power, apparently, and th this makes even less sense later. Like, believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm going through this pretty quick because, like I said, a lot of this is unnecessary. So Sia runs into Michael, who, remember, is the guy who came and got her for her testing, and he apparently knows about uh, all the evil stuff that's going on, and he knows that she met Simon during the final test, and apparently Simon is with the Rebels, Drink for Rebels, because, you know, the Hunger Games had that, and... Uh, Everyone else needs to have that now, okay. The thing is, in this case, why are there rebels? Like, the testing is bad, yes, I, I will grant you that. But it's only a small part of the government, and from what we see, the rest of the government doesn't seem, like, draconian or tyrannical or anything. It seems like things are working out fine, other than this one thing. And so... Literally all they would have to, the rebels would have to do in order to end the testing would either release evidence to the world that shows everyone what's going on about it and then it would get shut down pretty quick, or just attack the leaders of the testing. Like, you know, assassinate a couple of them and then problem solved. Like, the economy seems fine. The, the, like, even uh, Five Lakes is uh, a bit poor, but, like, they have enough to eat and there aren't like, diseases or anything, they aren't getting all of their, uh, resources siphoned off to enrich Tosu City. Like, the government, uh, as I said, doesn't seem authoritarian. I think it's democratic, because the president later mentions that she was elected, but it's not really gone into much detail about. Like, rebellions are built... Now, a lot of people in first world countries don't seem to quite grasp this, but rebellions are built on a really nasty combination of anger and desperation. That's why civil wars are sometimes so nasty, or pretty much always so nasty, is because it's a combination of anger and desperation. Just hating... If just hating your government, killing some of your kids, caused people to rebel, then a lot of countries would, <laughs> would uh, have rebellions. Like, the United States government would have an open rebellion going on right now. So, the long and short here is that Michael tells her the rebels are actually trying to find a way to end the testing without a war, because a civil war would be very devastating, which... Okay, I, I actually kind of like that. It's not completely original. I have seen it a couple of times, but it is at least different than The Hunger Games. And so, okay, sure, we're doing something a little bit different, and for now, Sia just has to blend in. Like, that's all fine. The only issue is that this conversation takes more than 20 pages. Like, Jesus, guys. Get to the point. So Sia goes to meet the other students that are in the government studies section. Uh, the important ones are Will, who you, we know, but he's also nice now, I guess. Like, he, he's... We find out later he's mostly just pissed off at the government because his brother gets killed. Like, you, you remember I mentioned it was Will and Gil were in the test, and Gil just failed one of them, so he's, he's gone now, and Will is pissed off about that, so... At least he changes, you know, I'll give him that. He's pretty much the only character who develops over the course of the story. Uh, and then there's Raph, who is an upperclassman, and his dad is actually one of the high-up testing officials. And that's it. Like, those are the only ones that are important besides Sia. So Sia goes through a sort of uh, hazing. They call it an induction, but that's what it is. It's a hazing. 
and basically they lock her in her room, they shut off all the electricity so it's dark, and she has to escape by using a screwdriver to take the hinges off of her door. And... I mean, that seems like a lot of effort for a hazing, but, like, whatever, these people are extremely weird. And then there's some time where everyone, Sia included, is just, like, getting to know each other, and it's, uh... I mean, th this part's not awful. Like, like I keep saying, there's parts of this, these books that are really not as bad as they could be. But then later, they have a phase two for the induction. Like, why? Well, like, why? I, I don't understand. Why are you going to this much effort? Like, I wasn't in a frat in college, but my understanding is that usually when you go through a hazing, they just, like, shave your head and throw you into the lake or something. Like, what? Why, why all this effort? And especially because phase two of the hazing is, like, huge. It's basically just a scavenger hunt on the outskirts of Tosu City. Like, they... They have to get a skimmer, and they go, like, literal miles between every, uh, thing that they find. And the, all the puzzles and stuff that are set up would have taken a long-ass time to do. Like, who puts this much effort in? H has, the, has the author of this book ever met university students? They're, they're not the type of people that would do this. Uh, but, you know, this is a really long section of the book. I think this is, like, a quarter to a third of the entire page count, so I'm just gonna go through the highlights. Uh... At one point, Sia gets locked in a box, and one of the other students wants to just leave her there to die. Be because everyone's a psycho for some reason in this series? Uh, but uh, Will actually helps her out. Like, without Will, she would have been left there and she would have died. Um, Sia gets trapped with a python in a cage, uh, which apparently pythons are just, like, really common in her hometown, because... All the chemicals that mutated other animals were like... They, they helped reptiles for some reason, so... There's a lot of snakes up in Michigan, I guess? Like, that's a little weird, but I've, I've seen dumber, so I'm, I'm not gonna focus on it too much. Uh, they literally interrupt a meeting of the legislature, and Sia briefly meets the president. Okay, that, that happens. Uh, Another kid from a different group uh, falls into a chasm and dies, and eventually Sia and her group pass by accepting defeat. Like, they, they are supposed to cross a chasm without a bridge, and they just decide, you know what, we can't do this. So they all sit down, and then the people extend the bridge, and they go, congratulations, you passed. Like, okay, that, that's a little stupid, but whatever. And, uh, like I said, they, they do meet uh, the president. Her name is President Collant. Kolindar? Col Kolindar. Some, something like that. And, um, that she just meets Sia, and at the beginning there's nothing too strange about it, but I would think they'd be more annoyed by having their business interrupted by these teenagers. Uh, however, I will say that the legislature is just called the Debate Chamber, and that's kind of stupid. Like, you, you'd think hearing the name Debate Chamber that that's like the room where they meet, but no, that's actually what it's called. You, d you don't have to use a lot of imagination to come up with a name for the legislature. You don't even have to come up with a name for it at all if you don't have to, but at least give it a name that makes sense. Like, you could call it Congress, or the Senate, or the Parliament, or, you know, something like that. If you wanted to be a little more original with it, you could call it the House of Representatives, the House of Delegates, uh, the Workers' Council, the Council of Elders, the People's Assembly, you know, like, that. there's a lot of names like that and that have been used both in real life and in fiction before. Like, just spend a minute or two coming up with one. But basically, this whole section is doing a speed run of the test from the last book, because that's what the Hunger Games did, you know? In Catching Fire, they all had to go back to the arena and do something that was similar, but also very different. But at the very least, that came in the latter part of the book, and it had a very cool ending which led into the rebellion in the final book and this just yeah you you passed your test like jesus guys at least try so anyways there's some more school stuff and sia starts searching for proof of uh the testing officials killing kids so that the rebels can release it like i said they're looking for evidence and so she's trying to find like recordings or something that they can release to the public i feel like it would be a lot like they would have been able to find it before this point but Whatever, it's it's fine. And 
After a while at school, they get internships assigned. I'm like, okay, that that's fine. And Sia gets an internship with the president. I, I feel like that's something you should have to, one, sign up for, and two, really work for. Like, there should be a lot of people competing for that spot, but... Uh, fuck it, man. I don't care anymore. So the president hints at disliking the testing, but she doesn't come right out and say it, so Sia's thinking, oh, she might be a valuable ally. And later she talks with Michael and he confirms it. Like, he confirms, yeah, that President Kalindar wants it to end. She, she doesn't like it anymore, but for, for whatever reason, the testing is, like, a mostly independent part of the government, and so the president can't interfere with it. Who designed this governmental system? Who did... Yeah, we got four branches of government. We got the executive, the legislative, the judicial branch, and uh, the testing. Like, who, who designed this? I don't understand. This is so fucking dumb. Oh my god. And anyways, long story short, um, Dr. Barnes, while he doesn't officially have power over the rest of government, he does have a lot of influence because he knows a lot of the people in, like, the legislature and stuff. And the president wants to actually reform the government so that she does have power over the testing so that she can stop killing kids. Like, she, she can stop the kids from dying, which, okay, that makes sense. And at the same time, Dr. Barnes wants her removed from office. Like, they don't use the word impeached. They refer to it as a vote of no confidence. Actually, they refer to it as a vote of confidence, which is not what it's called, and that's also usually from parliamentary systems, which don't have a president, but I'm overthinking this, I will admit. Uh, the point is, this is all trying to add danger, and it doesn't. Like, it's basically saying, hey, Dr. Barnes is going to become president if we don't hurry up and get this done within a couple of weeks, and like, it, it, okay. It, it, the thing is, Dr. Barnes is already in this position of power, like, him being president doesn't make much of a difference. He's already killing all these kids. It doesn't really add anything. So anyways, uh, Raph, who, remember, is one of the kids from Sia's school, who his dad works with, Dr. Barnes, uh, he joins up with Sia and the Rebels because his sister, Emily, also was in the testing, and she also disappeared. She was redirected, and at this point, they're still wondering what redirected means. And basically, he manages to grab a recording of Dr. Barnes just saying some evil stuff and saying, yes, haha, children die. Uh, which is way too easy, like way too easy for them to get it. Like they should have had to go through some like Ocean's Eleven heist or something to get a hold of that. But whatever, whatever. So they go to bring it to the rebels, and while they're doing this, another kid tries to stop them, and then Sia kills him, and she's like so sad and upset and full of PTSD, and I'm um, oh, okay. And uh, so they go to the rebel camp, which is right outside town. Like, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, when I'm trying to hide from my enemy, I go right next to them where they could find me at any moment. Uh, <clears throat> and she also notices her brother Zine is there, and she doesn't get to talk to him, but he's apparently hanging out with the rebels now, and she's like, what the fuck is going on? Which, this might hit a little harder if, one, we actually had an idea of what Sia's relationship with Zine was like, other than he's my brother and I love him, like that. There's not much to it beyond that. Or two, we actually knew who Zine was as a person. Or three, some combination of those. And we don't, so it's just kind of like, oh, uh, really now? You know, it's not that surprising or anything. But anyways, um, they give the recording to Michael, and then Michael brings it over to Simon, and then Simon kills him. Because, oh, there's a big twist. It turns out Dr. Barnes controls the rebels. Uh, because he knew people would be upset with him, so he wanted to gather them all in one place so that he could make sure they didn't actually do anything. Um, all right. Yeah, I, I'm just, all right, I'm not gonna, not talking about that. And the thing is, this happens like five pages from the end of the book too, so that we don't even really have time to absorb this, this supposedly shocking event. Like, Sia just runs off and she uh, get brings out her communicator, which again, she stole, I'm gonna keep bringing that up because it's really a shitty thing to do, Sia. Uh, and she gets a message from Z, and then that's where the book ends. So, there's really no denouement here. Like, we, we had the climax, which wasn't very good, but it was a climax, and then we didn't really have that falling action where we're like, oh shit, now what? Because this is trying to be like the ending of Catching Fire, where 
you know, they escape from uh, the arena, and they're like, hey, the rebellion has fully kicked off now. Like, there's th there's a full-on war. Are you going to help us, Katniss? And she's like, yeah, but also Pete is gone, so she's really pissed about that, and etc. Whereas this, it's just like, oh, okay, uh, we, we, our plan to end the testing didn't work. Let's try a new one. So it's it's trying, again, to be like the Hunger Games, but it's just failing at every turn. So, yeah, that that's a... Uh, this one is much more obviously bad than the first one. Like, the first one is bad, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it's bad in more complex ways, which you need to go into a little bit of detail about to really understand, like, oh, okay, it's trying to be the Hunger Games, but it doesn't lay the foundation that it needs to be, blah, blah, blah. Whereas this one, it seems the author just had no idea where to go after the first book. You know, it feels like she, she said, okay, I want to write a book about... It's basically the Hunger Games, but I have to change it up a little bit so I don't get called a rip-off artist, and uh, it'll be all about this testing. And like, okay, then what happens after the testing is over? Uh, the, there's there's uh, some stuff. I don't want to just do a rebellion, so there's uh, some stuff happens. And, like, you know, there, there's very little to it, you know? There's just there's very little Tomas as well. Like, you might have noticed I barely brought him up in here, and that's because he's barely in there. Like... If you're going to have the main character have a romance like that, at least, uh, at least have it take up some time. You know, this, they just decided, eh, we'll separate them because, I don't know, I just don't feel like writing it. And basically the only bits of Tomas we get are, apparently he never lost his memory of the testing. Which just, uh, again, why didn't Sia just have that happen? Like, it's, it's a very small detour, detour, but it was a detour that she had to send herself a message, and all that. Uh, and Tomas also just wants to go home, and that's about all we learn. So, yeah, again, what's the point of having the romance there if we're barely going to talk about it? But, anyways, yeah, that, that whole thing could have been less than 50 pages, and now we are at graduation day, which is the final book. The final test is the deadliest. Ooh. So this is several days later, despite the urgency that they were trying to build at the end of the second book, uh, and Sia is apparently still really sad about things. I think about the hurt I felt when Zine disappeared before I left for the testing. Of all of us, he is the most passionate, the easiest to upset, the quickest to react when his emotions are stirred, and hardest hit when those he loves are wounded or taken away. Okay, I, I am just a broken record at this point, like, show, don't tell. You know, if they had actually shown Zine uh, being super emotional and all that, then it would have been a bit easier to buy into, but, like, we, we don't get shown that. We're just told about it, apparently, after the fact, to justify his actions post-hoc. Basically, Sia uh, mopes around for a little bit, and then she explains the situation to some others, including Tomas, and she just decides, okay, you know what, let's get some more recordings. Let, let's find more evidence, and then we can release it without going to the Rebels, because the Rebels are just evil dudes pretending not to be evil. And as a brief aside, it is mentioned that safety officials, who which are basically their name for police officers, which patrol Tosu City, they just call them safety officials, apparently they carry weapons. But it doesn't say anything beyond that. Like, what kind of weapons? It just says they're silver weapons, rather. That could mean a lot of things. It, it could be handguns, they could be nunchucks, they could be swords, they could be spears, they could be assault rifles, like... The, but then, the thing is, the thing is, that's, that's a little bit of a misdetail, which is not, like, the end of the world. But then, right after that, they have a page-long explanation for why the safety officials are the only ones allowed to carry weapons in government buildings. Like... They have this whole thing saying, like, oh, yes, well, debates used to get really heated sometimes. They wanted to make sure nobody else could start a fight. Like, you don't need to go into detail. Okay, it's government building. Only the cops are allowed to have guns. That It's understandable why that rule is in place. Like, e even if you don't necessarily agree with it, like, it, it's understandable why that rule is in place. Why would you give us a page-long explanation of that if you're not even going to tell us what kind of weapons these guys have? It's... It's such a strange thing to me. So Sia talks to the president some more, and the president just straight up says, look, I'm about to be removed from office. Like, Dr. Barnes has all the votes he needs to do so. Uh, 
And so Sia, she tells Sia, like, you're going to have to kill Dr. Barnes and some of the other high-up testing officials. Otherwise, they're just going to remove me from office and he's going to be president. What? 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 Okay. Okay, um, the thing is, President Kolindar should not be president because she has allowed herself to be put into a position where she will no longer be president unless she can convince this 16-year-old girl to assassinate some of her political rivals. Th this woman is demonstrably really fucking bad at being in charge of things. So eventually, Sia tells her friends and she says like, look, just getting recordings isn't gonna be enough anymore for some reason. We're going to have to kill Dr. Barnes and some of the others and then that'll bring the testing to an end. And eventually they all agree to it and then <sighs> this happens. Can they be trusted? To learn the answer, Tomas and I have only one choice. We will need to stage our own testing. Just, uh, this is the same thing over and over and over again. I just can't. I just can't. I just can't do this right now. Uh, this author just like ran out of ideas. Like I said, this could have been one decent length book and hell, by cutting out a bunch of the extra stuff and maybe tweaking some of the details that were there, it may have been a fine enough book, but this is just laughably bad. So they start by testing this girl named Stasia, and I'm not going into detail, but uh, she passes, they decide she's trustworthy. And apparently at this university, there's an entire building dedicated to calculus. Like not, not a mathematics building or an engineering building, just a building completely devoted to calculus. What kind of fucking school is this place? Yeah, I'm just gonna skip a lot of this because I honestly don't care. Like, she gets Stasia on her side. Uh, she goes to an abandoned building to set up for another test. I might just take a little recess over to the old schoolhouse. He's right! Of course! We have to go there every episode! She gets attacked by some quaternary characters whose names I'm not even going to mention because they're so unimportant. Uh, and then she kills them, and it's, like, super sad and intense and stuff. Uh, and then she tests another guy named Enzo with a radio bomb. Yeah, basically she sets up a radio, and it's done in a way where if you push the on button, it'll explode and kill you. And she gives it to Enzo, and she tells him, like, hey, there's some sensitive info on here, so don't, don't turn it on. She's basically testing his curiosity to see if he'll actually do it, and if he turns it on, then, you know, he's no longer a problem. There, there are so many ways this, this could go wrong. Uh, like, for starters, how does Sia know how to make bombs? Like, it's not, it's actually not that simple, guys. It's, it's a surprisingly complex process. Uh, but also, what if somebody else comes across it and pushes it and turns it on? That would kill some innocent person. And guess what? That's exactly what happens later. Literally exactly that happens later. So a little while later, Sia makes a symbol of rebellion. It is, uh, two crossed lightning bolts, which is the symbol we have on the, on the front of the book here. And why does she make a symbol of rebellion? Because the Mockingjay was a symbol of rebellion in the Hunger Games. And the thing is, in, in the Hunger Games, it just came about naturally. You know, like, they, they had the whole history behind the Mockingjays and how they were not supposed to survive, but they just did anyways. And how uh, Katniss had just a pin of it, and so it became kind of a symbol for her and for... Her, and later she became the symbol of the rebellion, so you know, it just it, it was justified at least. Whereas this, uh, Sia just decided it looked cool, I guess. And the author had to put it in because that's what The Hunger Games does. Uh, so then, as I said, another student snoops up on uh, Sia, and he tries to figure out, like, oh, she's up to something, What what's she gonna do? And then he turns the radio on and blows himself up and he dies. And then Sia's like, oh, People are going to realize I had a bomb in my room and they're going to start asking questions. We should run now. So her and Tomas run off and they hide in an abandoned house. And then Tomas is able to make like a bunch of magical futuristic medicine using a couple of roots he found nearby. And he says like, yeah, this is this will help you. And it, this is a pain um, killer, but it will make you sleepy. And you might think that they'll be using this at some point, but they don't. And uh, eventually... Uh, some of the others arrive, including Will, and Enzo, and Raph, and Stasia, and, uh, 
they just decide, okay, uh, we're backed into a corner now, and we have very little time, so we're just gonna have to kill Dr. Barnes and the others now. And, uh, <clears throat> basically, their plan, <clears throat> mm, excuse me, is to set off some explosions as a distraction. Again, Sia just knows how to make bombs. I don't know, it, and it's not even just knowing how to make it. The materials are usually hard to get, for very good reason, but... Okay, whatever. Uh, they set off explosions as distractions, and then they're going to just, I don't know, walk up and kill their targets, I guess. Like, it, it they're not very well thought out plans. E even though they spend like 40 pages coming up with it, it's just not all that well thought out or that well put together. And that's like the last third of the book, really. So Sia and Raph uh, go together to Raph's father's house, and they question him a little bit about the testing, and about how Raph's sister was killed and then, or redirected, and then this happens. It doesn't matter where she is. What matters is that Dr. Barnes has allowed these students to contribute to our society in a meaningful way. They weren't strong enough to become leaders, but they are still able to assist our top scientists in understanding the worst corruptions that were inflicted upon our world and our race. It's because of her and the other students that we've been able to make such great strides in reversing some of the minor human mutations. Emily isn't a scientist. She's not working in some secret lab conducting experiments that will fix everything caused by the war. Of course she's not running experiments. My chest tightens as I understand what Raph's father is saying. Then what is she... Raph's voice trails off. Has he come to the same terrible conclusion I have? If the failed testing and university candidates are not in charge of the experiments, then the only thing left for them is to take part in them. Yeah, so... Apparently, the mutated humanoids that they ran into in the first book, and which have not been mentioned up until now, are all the previous testing candidates who were redirected. Like, they just did experiments on them to figure out what causes the mutation so that they can reverse it, which... Like, okay, that, that part makes sense, but why would you do this on your, your brightest minds, your best and brightest, who are supposed to help you go to the future? Like... Even setting the morality of it aside, this is just an inefficient way to do it. Like, wouldn't it make more sense to do this on, like, the dregs of society? You know, the disabled, or the poor, or the stupid? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't that just make more sense? You're not wasting all this talent? So after hearing this, after hearing that his dad basically killed his sister, Raph shoots his dad and kills him. And, uh, I, I do kind of like that moment. It makes perfect sense for him to do so, but, uh, at the same time, it's really telling that this secondary character gets this moment. He, he gets this defining moment where he gets to do something, and Sia and Tomas and most of the other major characters don't get anything like this. Like, you know, Sia never has to make, like, a crazy decision like that uh, in order to survive or in order to save the day or anything like that. She just does heroic things for the most part. And so she stays just such a blank slate throughout the end of the series, you know? Like, even if the world is stupid, and even if the story doesn't make much sense, you can save a lot of that by just having good characters who you actually care about and want to see succeed, and this series just fails to do that at basically every turn. It's actually kind of... It's a little bit depressing, because I see little bits of promise poking out through this, uh... through the cracks in the series, and... None of that promise is ever realized. So they run off and they find Dr. Barnes in the testing facility and Sia's about to shoot him, but then somebody else shows up and she's disarmed. And this is about 50 pages from the end and most of the last 50 pages is just a long drawn out conversation between her and Dr. Barnes. So the cliff notes is that actually the president wants the testing to continue and she wants to expand it, but Dr. Barnes thinks it's stupid, for good reason, which I've already explained, and he wants it to end. But apparently, he doesn't have the power to reform it or end it, even though earlier they were saying he has the power to reform and end it. Oh, look, there's a plot hole there. Uh, okay. And basically, they came to an agreement that the president will end things if Sia kills Dr. Barnes through some logic, which is not actually that logical, I'm not even gonna bother with that. Basically, it's like, oh, we don't actually need the testing to prove that people can do this. My camera's battery keeps dying, I should buy a new one. Now, I'm not sure why Dr. Barnes would be willing to trust a politician in this scenario, because 
I, I just, why in general would you trust a politician, but whatever. Apparently, if Sia kills Dr. Barnes, then the president has given her word she will end the testing. So, okay, uh, that's, that's the plot now, I guess. Anyway, some soldiers break in, try to stop her from killing Dr. Barnes, and then some rebels just appear out of nowhere. And then there's a gunfight, and Dr. Barnes is killed in the crossfire. And so is Zine, because Zine showed up there at the end. And, uh, like, I, I know it sounds like I'm just trying to make this sound very unengaging, but that's exactly what it's like when you're reading it. Like, it just sort of, it just ha happens <laughs> like that. And, uh, and then the president arrives, and... She says, all right, see ya, you passed the test, so I guess the testing is over now. Like, she didn't even check to see if Sia killed Dr. Barnes. Like, does this even count? Did ba Dr. Barnes just have to die somehow? Because I feel like there'd be cameras or something? And there's, a, he was killed in the gunfight, he wasn't even killed by, this, this, this isn't the deal you came to, the agreement you came, uh. So there is a very brief epilogue where Sia is back at Five Lakes and she buries her brother Zine and then she tells Tomas that, hey, I'm gonna go back to Tosu City because there's still work to be done because that's how the Hunger Games ended. You know, it, it couldn't just, it, it didn't want to have a happy ending. So it's like, hey, the, the world is still kind of fucked. Uh, and that, that that's it, it's kind of unsatisfying. And really, if I could describe this whole series in a word, it would just be unsatisfying. You know, it, it's not the worst thing ever, but there's not much build up to things, and then once those things happen, the payoff isn't very good either. Like, there's no effort in fleshing out the world, or the characters, or in trying to make the story make sense, and honestly, a lot of the individual plot points that happen just aren't that interesting. And there's a lot of time wasted, as I said. There's a lot of time where things are just stretched out and we go over similar things over and over and over again. Like, the, the scavenger hunt in the second book is probably the worst example of this because I kept expecting something to happen. Like, they ran into the rebels or they uh, it found some information about the government's conspiracy or something. But no, I, I seriously was just, it was a waste of time. Like, even ba going back over it uh, while I was writing my notes for this, I was like, oh yeah, I kind of forgot about a lot of this stuff because, you know, normally when you reread through a book that you like, you get to a certain point and you're like, oh yeah, this is the part where they find the the dead body under the woods and then later they bring in Tanner and he's like, that's my sister. And everybody's like, what? Like, you remember those big moments, but the scavenger hunt, even though it takes up a huge chunk of the book, doesn't really have any of those. So, there's just so much time wasted, but... and a lot of what happens is obviously really dumb, but it's just so hard to get mad at this. You know, like... As I said, some parts are decent. You know, uh, not a lot of them, and they aren't really that great, but there are some parts that are decent, so I can't get too mad for that reason, but I also... I can't get mad because it doesn't feel like the author tried. You, you know, it, and maybe that seems paradoxical because I'm honestly usually very annoyed when authors don't try, but for whatever reason, this one just feels like she just really scribbled it out and tossed it out the door. I, like, again, I don't know her, but that's just what it feels like. And this, this is just trend chasing in its purest form, you know? The Hunger Games, was popular at this time, and the, uh, I believe the first book came out in 2013, which is uh, r the year after the movie came out, so it was like, that was the peak of this genre. It was like, yes, get, it, she was just trying to write it as quick as she could and get it out the door so that she could grab herself a slice of that pie, and while that is not very artistically uh, good, I, I don't, I don't know a good term for it, but like, it's not admirable, let's say. It is just trend chasing in its purest form, and I kinda knew that it would be stupid like that when I came into this, so like, whose who's fault is it really? And 
Hell, maybe, as I said before, this is just a palate cleanser after reading The Way of the Shadow Wolf, so it's hard to get upset because I know how bad things really can get. And uh, there are a few other dumb bits that I didn't really have time to bring up before, but there's like other countries apparently do exist, but they've just had no contact with the United Commonwealth until now. Like, it, just in their final conversation, Dr. Barnes mentions, yeah, other countries are starting to reach out to us, but they don't like the fact that we're doing the testing, so we, we, got, we kinda gotta stop that, which... Okay, that makes sense, I guess. Um, or how they keep mentioning that land has to be revitalized, because, you know, all the chemicals and everything, they, it has to be revitalized in order to uh, be able to do agriculture and stuff there, but they're still having all these colonies that are flung off all over the place, and there's land right around Tosu City that isn't revitalized, wouldn't that be the first place that you go to? And there's nothing else that's really crazy, though. Like, you know, that, that that's a thing. Like, this series, while it does go crazy in a few bits, like, mostly to do with the testing, like, <laughs> that kid getting the nail shot into his eye was honestly really unintentionally funny to me. And all the bits of, like, oh, if you screw up, you're gonna get poisoned. Like, that that's just, like, so over the top that it is kind of funny and kind of stupid and or extremely stupid. But a lot of the story is just too subdued, I think is another way of putting it. Like, I can't get upset at something that is just so mundane, you know? Like, I, I can be bored by it, or I can point out that it's stupid and bad, but I can't get upset with it. As I said, there is some potential that shines through here, uh, particularly with the bits that I kind of liked, like the, you know, the fourth test where they're just trekking through the wilderness from Chicago to Tosu City is really not the worst thing ever. Like, I, I see hints of what could have been a decent book there, or even a decent book series there, but there just... there just isn't enough. You know, you know, like, I see little bits of promise, little bits of potential shining through, and that, that's all I see, though. L little bits of it. And... I don't know. I, I don't have anything else to say. This, uh, the testing series was a phenomenal waste of my time, certainly, and I, I'd be interested in hearing if anyone actually enjoyed it when they were younger. I'm sure some of you did. I think the only real lesson to be learned here is that just because you're following the formula for something, which in this case was The Hunger Games, does not mean you will instantly be as good as The Hunger Games, because you still have to understand what made that thing work. And I don't have anything else to add beyond that. That is, uh, this was a pretty big waste of my time, but hopefully some of you were entertained. Uh, that's all. Goodbye. Special thanks to everyone who watched this far, and a special thanks especially to all of my patrons, and especially, especially thanks to my $10 and up patrons. Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselovich, Echo, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis-Bennett, Marilyn Roxy, Matthew Bordreau, Michael Weingartner, Microphone, Peep the Toad, Return of Cardamom, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, and Ve Victus. If you want to get your name up here, then considering joining my patron, patroning page, um, and if you don't want to do that, then you could always become a YouTube channel member. And if you don't want to do that, then just, you know, rating the video, commenting on it, subscribing to my channel, sharing it around. You know, that, that works too. That helps a lot. Um, th thank you and good night. Well, it might not be night where you are at, but goodbye.